dream I get hung up tied and strung up on your scene I'm something far away It doesn't matter what I say You've got your simple way You're safely tucked away Aren't you happy? Aren't you Jim Lehrer is on vacation. Every night across this country, 70 to 80 million Americans sit down in front of the television, and a large part of their evening escapism is crime. And in those endless police adventures, even the most complicated crimes tend to get neatly wrapped up in 30 minutes or one hour. It's not that way in real life. Tonight, July 29th, is a date that clearly haunts one man in New York. He calls himself Son of Sam. A year ago tonight, he shot and killed a teenage girl and wounded her boyfriend. Since then, he struck six more times at intervals of five to six weeks, each time using the same 44 caliber revolver, usually choosing young women with long brunette hair. He's hinted in a letter to the press that he will strike again, possibly tonight. For months, police have mounted the largest murder hunt in New York's history, with no success so far. Tonight, a picture of that investigation. It started a year ago tonight, July 29th, 1976, 1 a.m., Westchester Heights in the Bronx. Two girls were shot sitting in a parked car. Donna Loria, 18, a medical technician, was killed. Her friend Jody Valenti wounded. October 23rd, 2 a.m., a couple sitting in a car in Flushing, Queens. Carl Denario, 20, bank security guard, wounded, his girlfriend not injured. November 27th, 12.40 a.m., Belrose, Queens. Two girls sitting on a front porch after returning from the movies. Both Joanne Lomino, 18, and Donna DeMassey, 17, wounded. January 30th, 1977, 12.30 a.m., Forest Hills, Queens. A couple sitting in a parked car. Christine Freund, 26, killed. Her boyfriend, unhurt. March 8th, 7.30 to 7.45 p.m., half a block from the same spot. 19-year-old student at Columbia University, Virginia, Voskarichian, killed while walking home. April 17th, 3 a.m., Baychester, the Bronx. A couple sitting in a parked car. Both Valentina Soriani, 18, and her boyfriend, Alexander Issa, shot dead. June 26th, 3.20 a.m., Bayside, Queens. A couple in a parked car. Judy Placido, 17, and her boyfriend, Salvatore Lupo, both wounded. In one year, five killed, six wounded. 
To track down the killer, New York has assigned 70 detectives, headed by veteran homicide investigator Timothy Dowd. This man is a very difficult man. He has left practically no clues to his identity. Um, he's very successful in, in getting to a location where he wants to find a victim, and he's been unusually successful in leaving the location without being discovered. Um, we've had, we've ha have in the past prepared sketches um, and the people who gave us the information on which the sketches are based had uh, a varied uh, opportunity of, of uh, seeing this man. Um, some uh, he has come directly up to face to face and some others have seen him as he passed by. Uh, we've now chosen uh, two of the sketches as, as since they were made by two people who had an opportunity to see him over a, a small space of time and we've uh, selected those two sketches and we use them as our, our basic sketches. The psychiatrists tell us that this man is uh, paranoid and uh, schizophrenic. Um, he's neurotic. Uh, they say he's very likely to be the type of person who keeps to himself, uh, who possibly lives alone or is a very silent member of a family. Uh, he would be regarded as odd in some, if you were to know him as for what he is. Uh, it, there's a possibility, some psychiatrists tell us, that he's able to hold a job such as a mechanic or a machinist or a clerical person. Uh, then there are some psychiatrists who tell us that his, his uh, mental uh, abilities are, are insufficient f to uh, allow him to hold a steady job. So we're in between the two situations of, can he, does he work at all or does he work at some silent occupation, some quiet, uh, re exclusive uh, occupation? Do you think he knows the people who he kills? No, I don't think so. Nothing in this investigation has led us to that belief. What kind of weapon does he use? He uses a 44 caliber uh, Charter Arms Bulldog revolver, which is a uh, five-shot uh, revolver. He generally fires four shots, and uh, he doesn't fire the fifth shot if, he, if it's loaded with a fifth shot. Uh, on practically all occasions that he, he's um, assaulted people, he has fired four shots. On a few occasions, he's one occasion he fired one. That was to a female, the, incidentally, who got killed, who was a pedestrian. He shot her directly in the face with one shot. And on another occasion, he fired three shots, to our knowledge. Is that a relatively unusual gun? Uh, it's not an unusual gun. It's a revolver. Uh, it has a low muzzle velocity. Uh, uh, 44 caliber, the, the projectile being kind of large, it would have a, a kind of a thudding effect on the person that it would hit. Uh, and it would not penetrate as much as, say, some other type of high-velocity, muzzle-velocity bullet would, would do. Well, once you know what kind of gun it is, does that help you in terms of narrowing down the possibilities? you be able to check up on the kinds of guns, people who have those guns? Well, uh, there have been 28,000 guns uh, manufactured by the Charter Arms Company and distributed throughout the United States. Um, we are, we ha are assisted by the Alcohol Tax and Firearms Unit of the federal government, the Treasury Department. They've been very helpful. and. Uh, the material that we've prepared here, they have distributed uh, around the country to 166,000 uh, gun dealers uh, asking for information. We prepared a, uh, a letter with uh, certain information requested, and we hope that as a result of that, that we will get some information back from around the country. Meanwhile, we've uh, made a survey of New York State. On We have printouts from the New York State Police, and uh, we have printouts from the J New Jersey State Police, and uh, we're getting printouts from the Connecticut State Police of people who are licensed to possess that type of gun. Uh, we're trying to test those guns as we go along, and uh, uh, that's a kind of a slow process. In letters to, in a letter to the police, and then in another letter to Jimmy Breslin from the Daily News, he called himself the Son of Sam and talked about that. What do you make of that use of the name? What do you think of the Son of Sam? Well, we have had all kinds of uh, suppositions by people, guesses as to what, he, what that designation means. Uh, the average person, the average letter we get here uh, remind us that uh, a lot of people in the Vietnam War refer to themselves as sons of Sam, meaning sons of Uncle Sam. Uh, some people refer to the uh, uh, biblical story of Samson and, Goli and uh, Goliath. Samson and, and uh, Delilah, excuse me. Um, and um, something to do with, fe since in this case, uh, most of the females have long hair. Uh, they think of the, the character Delilah, or rather Samson himself, with, with long hair. And of course, when the hair was cut off, uh, he lost his strength. So they make some kind of biblical connection. And of course, we have it also connected with the Satanism, uh, diabolism, uh, some Sam being, being Sam the devil. And we just don't know what he means. And uh, in one of the letters uh, that he, of the two that he has written, 
the one that he wrote to Jimmy Breslin, the columnist for the uh, newspaper here in New York City. Um, he gave us some uh, things, uh, he said, to, to follow and, and to check him on, and uh, these things, uh, such as the 22 Disciples of Hell and some other designations, uh, we've never been able to find out just what they meant. An investigation like this must be full of routine. What is, what is some of the routine tasks that have to be done? We have to check hospitals, uh, psychiatric hospitals especially. We've done a big, a big uh, investigation in that area, and uh, we've had some good cooperation, generally from people who work in hospitals rather than from psychiatrists because of the, the fear they have that they would violate the doctor-patient relationship. Um, we've checked uh, stolen cars, we've checked arrest records, um, we've checked summons records, uh, there are a whole lot of things that we do and some other things I'd rather not say that uh, you have to do routinely because you, you can't just hope to find, uh, you can't hope to be lucky, you have to prepare to be lucky. Uh, to do that, you have to do a thorough investigation. And, uh, it's been given the highest priority by uh, all the officials in the city of New York, police commission, mayor. Uh, they've put tremendous staff, equipment, and all the resources of the department are into that. Even to the point that this is like one of the only cases in years outside of a cop killing that we have, we have volunteers uh, working on their own time on this case. Is this a frustrating case for you, personally? Uh, I, I don't feel frustrated. I, I just feel that we just have to work a little harder and uh, that we'll make our own break. We keep digging and we'll dig it out. Does it take a long time to check out a lot of these leads? Some of the leads, uh, if we're lucky, can be checked out uh, maybe in a period of hours. Uh, other leads, uh, you can stay on them two weeks. If the lead looks good enough to you and something is developing, and naturally you can stay on that longer. Is there a sense of intuition in your work? Do you sort of sense whether you think something's good or bad? or How do you, how do you decide whether you think a lead is going to be a good one or a bad one? Well, as far as the lead is concerned, naturally, if somebody gives you something solid, and then by solid I mean uh, I, I saw a fella uh, in a bar, and I know he had a gun on him, and it looked like a, a large caliber gun, and he visits this bar quite often. I'm sure if you go down on such and such an evening, you'll find him there. Uh, he looks like the composite. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure he has a previous arrest record. Uh, these are what we call uh, leads with meat. And uh, naturally, we try to run that individual down right away. Uh, we have been successful in many cases in coming across individuals that had weapons on them where arrests were made. We have made other arrests uh, as a result of this investigation. You mean arrests for other crimes? For other crimes, yes, for other crimes as a result of this investigation. Such as? Well, we have, we have made robbery arrests. We had made possession of uh, a weapon, a gun arrest. We had also made possession of knives arrests. People saw somebody uh, standing somewhere and saw a bulge and looked like the composite. When we went up to them, they, uh, they had weapons on them. We have made those arrests. Are, you, are there people that are being followed or tailed, I guess is the term that you would use? Do you have a list of people who you think are prime suspects in a situation like this? We have lists now, and, and we always have had lists. Uh, and some of them, after a certain amount of tailing, we discover we're on the wrong track and we eliminate them. And then, because of the information that constantly keeps coming from the public, we, we, we are supplied with new suspects who have a high priority. Uh, and uh, we, we tail them, too. Are you worried about this weekend coming up, this anniversary? We're worried about every day and every night um, uh, because we know we have a job to uh, oh, uh, prevention, which is, is differs from the average homicide in that, in that area, that facet of it. In that, uh, It's not the investigation of a homicide, it's also the investigation to prevent future possible homicides. And uh, we're worried, we're concerned about that, and, and, uh, but we also believe that uh, we have a very large amount of manpower, uniform manpower, and, and uh, detective manpower, and civilian clothes uh, people. And we're out there, and we have the bur boroughs of Bronx and Queens are heavily covered with manpower. And I think we'll be successful. He's going to make a mistake. He'll make a mistake. That's okay. One mistake to get him? That's all. One mistake. He'll get him. Somebody's going to get him. It's strange. They, they've had witnesses in this case, which is, you know, unusual that he's wounded people, and they've, they've seen him. No. That, that hasn't helped. Well, if you saw me for 
three or four seconds. You think you could describe me? I mean, this is my personal opinion. I mean, uh, someone's talking in a the car. They don't. They don't expect something like that. Someone's walking in the street. Somebody comes up behind you or right next to you, and bang. The most recent attack came one half block from this discotheque in the Bayside section of Queens. Now, he's attracted to places where young people congregate. Um, his victims usually are run from the age of female victims. His primary purpose to injure uh, run from the age of 17 years to say 21 tops. There's been one beyond that age, but uh, all the others have been less than 21 years old and more than 17. Uh, he finds that kind of person at uh, dance halls, discotheques, um, uh, restaurants, uh, bars and grills where you know, some bars and grills have the reputation where young people frequent and there are no old people in the bar at all. That kind of place, I think, he, uh, he, he frequents himself. Now, I don't think that he would enter the bar and uh, drink with the other people. It's just too convivial an attitude uh, and an atmosphere for him. Uh, I would think he'd uh, sneak around the outside and wait for an opportunity to see a boy and a girl come out and get in an automobile. And when they're seated in the automobile, then naturally he would come and assault them. Fear that the gunman is waiting to strike again has unnerved young women throughout Queens and the Bronx. If he wanted to shoot me, he wouldn't have a chance, really, because like I'm, I fly up the stairs four steps at a time. So like, you know. Well, what happened? The guy asked you to park. Don't lift off my own. No, no park. No. No, he's got, I'll tell you something. If a guy now ever asked me to park with him. I feel very, very uh, insulted, and I tell him to go take it on the hop. <laughs> Seriously, because it's, you know, he shouldn't have respect enough to know what's happening and not even ask. His anniversary's coming Friday. Yeah. And, you know, if they, people, people just don't realize these things don't end until they catch this guy, you know? And uh, when they, they've got to realize that you still got to be cautious. I mean, this guy's a nut. I'm not going out tomorrow night, not through the weekend. Catch a Friday. I was supposed to go to a party Friday night, and I'm not going. How come? I'm scared. He's crazy. He's killing all these people. I'd, I'd be stupid to go out. I mean, he's making it known that something's going to happen Friday night. So why should I go out? He yeah. uh, doesn't kill for another month and a half. So everybody calms down, all the girls come back out. I wouldn't go out the first week, but now I go out, because yeah. I figure a month yeah. passed, he forgot the about it. He strikes on a full yeah. moon, and this Saturday night's a full moon, and Friday's the 29th, and that's the Friday. anniversary yeah. of Donna Laurie, so like everybody better be cool. But we're all going away anyway, so. Yeah, we're going Let's away, so. we're not going away. staying around. The public, as, as uh, indicated by the attitude of the press and the TV people, uh, has been very cooperative and and I think they realize our situation the difficulty that we have and uh, I with their cooperation I think we'll be successful but we absolutely have to have the cooperation of the public uh, we've always said that uh, for this type of man to exist he has to live someplace and he has to live in the vicinity of where these shootings occur and uh, somebody has to know who he is and somebody has to have a feeling that he is what he is uh, you take a man who uh, commits these crimes usually after midnight even though we've had some one before midnight they're usually after midnight and you have a man that you suspect and you notice every once in a while that he comes home at uh, three o'clock in the morning four o'clock in the morning and he's uh, the, the, the lone t loner type of person who lives in a room or an attic or a basement or in the back of some place who doesn't uh, he's not an affable person who doesn't talk to people readily he doesn't make friendships readily I think people know that kind of an oddity in a neighborhood, and I, and I would think that it would put the two things together, the unusual character, of a person, personality character of this man, uh, joined together with the fact of coming home very late on some nights, especially the nights where they read in the press and they have been shootings. Um, I would think if they paid close attention, they would spot for us and, and report to us the exact man that we're looking for, and we'd be able to, to uh, tail him and track him down and do a thorough investigation and arrest him. Our reporter in that report was Dan Werner. The man Deputy Inspector Dowd reports to is John Keenan, New York City Chief of Detectives. Chief Keenan, tonight is the anniversary, as we've heard many times. Do you take seriously, do the police take seriously, the killer's implied threat to strike again on this date? In the uh, second of the two letters, the uh, uh, last letter that the killer wrote, he uh, made reference to this date and uh, 
indicated that we'd be hearing from him. And uh, so we are taking it seriously. We are taking every precaution uh, against the possibility that he will commit an attack tonight. It's a horrible thought to contemplate uh, in that we may, in this, uh, by this process, catch him by, through some mistake he makes. Uh, but uh, that's one way that he will be caught. You've got massive resources on this, all those detectives and the, uh, and the other resources. I've seen some reports saying it's costing $17,000 a day, these, these extra resources. Can good detective work actually find a man like this, or do you need to wait until he makes a mistake? No, no. His making a mistake is one of the ways he can be caught, and as I say, it's the least desirable because in the process someone may be killed. Uh, the, the other ways are, of course, the obvious one of his giving up giving himself up, uh, Is that likely responding to a plea. Like uh, it's possible, uh, and uh, I would suggest that Dr. Bond would uh, be more qualified to answer that. Uh, the other way is through investigative work, and as Inspector Dowd said, uh, somewhere out there is someone who knows this man and knows he's acting strangely, and if he comes forward, that's the best way that the case can be solved. Are you stymied for the moment? No, we're never stymied as long as we have things to investigate. You know, uh, we've, we've had... Uh, about, uh, over 4,000 pieces of information come in. Uh, almost half of those were worthy of investigation. And in the process, we've had eliminated uh, almost, uh, almost that many. We still have some people we're interested in. And as long as information keeps coming in, we're never stymied. And we're optimistic that we will eventually find him. Is it conceivable that a man like this could just stop now and disappear and never be found? Yes, uh, that's a distinct possibility. Uh, there have been cases in the past. There were uh, two cases I re recall reading about in the 1930s in New York City where uh, a man killed people similar to this and uh, stopped and were never, never found. In one case, he wrote a letter saying that he, was, he had committed his last crime and we wouldn't hear from him again. Uh -huh. An important tool for the police when the hunted man may well be a psychopath is the criminal psychologist. Dr. Charles Bann is a professor of psychology and associate dean at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. Do you believe a man of this makeup could stop and vanish forever? Yes, it's, it, it is conceivable. Um, I don't think that it's likely, but it happens from time to time. It would probably involve some kind of a change in his life uh, coming from some other direction, um, a relative returning, uh, changing his job, changing his place of residence, that kind of thing might change the in internal pressures on him, and then he could change his pattern. How would you describe what sort of a man this is likely to be? I differ a little bit from some of the psychiatrists, although the general picture really seems to be fairly clear. Um, he's, he, sh he should be a person who's, who's very much of a loner, not somebody who shares his feelings or even ideas about the world with anybody, but allows them to seethe within him. Um, I see him as a person who spends a great deal of his time alone, who has enormous resentments, uh, seething with um, anger and the sense of uh, not being in power of even over his own life, uh, feeling cut off from other people and particularly feeling slighted. Um, with the kind of encounter that most of us wouldn't take very seriously. Um, just saying hello to somebody and they simply say hello and walk by him, he'll experience that as a terrible rejection because he was hoping it would lead somewhere, but he's, I see him as too shy to follow through on that himself and then feeling hurt and rejected and put down by the lack of further response. What could be the motivation that would direct him principally towards young girls with long dark hair? I th my, you have to speculate about sure. this, of course, and my speculation is a series of rejections of the kind that I've described. Not that any one of the girls in question ever would have identified as rejection, but during his late teenage years, uh, being in a situation where he made that kind of, what shall I call it, halfway, one-step overtures toward people, uh, bringing, picking up something that somebody dropped and saying, here, this is for you. And when it didn't lead anywhere, he went home and felt terrific anger building up that he'd been cast away and thrown out. And One of the young people in the film mentioned that tonight there's a full moon and that that had some significance. Is that just ridiculous? Well, it's 98% it's ridiculous. Um, the uh, vampire concept and you know, some of the other um, lurid fictional concepts of full moon, but there is some 
um, experimental work being done, some scientific work being done on the uh, effects of the moon, and it's, there is some relationship that begins to appear uh, between violent acting out in prisons. They find that well, on full moon nights there appear to be more violent incidents. I, I don't think we have any explanation of it now, but there's, let's say, the germ of something there. There is speculation in the press that this could be either a policeman himself or related to a policeman, the son of a policeman, perhaps. Is that plausible to you? I think it's very, very unlikely. Um, that seems about as... It seems really quite remote. Uh, the only evidence or the only kind of information supporting it is his um, success in getting to where he has to be and getting to where he commits the well, crime and getting put, away from it. Let me put these to the chief. There are a couple of other things. They, they say, and I think the police have confirmed this, that he fires his revolver with a double-handed stance in a crouch, which suggests some training, perhaps, in the police. Yes, it, it certainly suggests that the man uh, knows how to use a gun, and uh, obviously he does. He hasn't missed uh, very often. Uh, but that training could uh, come certainly from police training. It could come from any investigative agency training. It could come from belonging to a pistol club or from being in the service or from watching television. Right. What about the letter in which he referred to the National Institute of Crime Control by its initials, which is not something every layman knows? No, that is a, a puzzling aspect uh, in, in that uh, that's, uh, NCIC is not a, uh, a commonly known uh, term. Uh, and uh, we, we understand we really don't know what it means. It may mean that he has some association with uh, some investigative agency. Yeah. Um, Inspector Dowd implied that there might be some, it wasn't easy for psychiatrists to give up the records of mental patients because of the doctor-patient relationship. Isn't there in a case like this a strong justification for revealing those, um, those records if to the police, if only to protect the man from himself and from society? Yes, the, there is a justification and I'm certain that psychiatrists who believe that the records that they had could be relevant would, would reveal them. Uh, of course, what they're concerned about is protecting uh, people who've had disturbances and um, are not at all related and, and who, incidentally, are trying to live new lives, as it were. They require all the protection that they can get. Um, my intuition is that uh, this person hasn't had treatment. Why is that? Uh, because of the periodicity of the crimes, the way the pressure builds up. Uh, he doesn't really seem to be able to regulate the pressure. Um, I don't feel that his letters are a compulsion to confess or anything of that kind, but really trying to share the meaning and still um, cleverly keep himself from being identified. As in these, referring to the periodicity of these crimes there, the repetitive nature, each time he commits another one, does that in a sense make it easier for you? Do you, do you understand him better each time and therefore get nearer to finding him, do you think? Yeah, obviously, uh, the, uh, each time he commits an act, exposes himself in some way, he will leave some behind him, <clears throat> some uh, evidence of what he has done. And uh, we have certain bits of physical evidence, we have certain uh, traits that are developing, and of course we understand him better, but unfortunately that doesn't or hasn't led us to him at this point. I um, mentioned at the beginning TV cop shows. Does the public understand the slowness of a police investigation like this, or do the TV shows, which they watch so much, make them expect much faster results? Unfortunately, they, it, it does lead to um, expectations of immediate results. Usually in the TV show, you have the situation in which there are two or three suspects and you have to narrow down to the right person. Uh, here you have... Um, an entire city full of people, uh, and the process is really more the process of constructing a picture from very small evidence. Uh, I think it's not dissimilar from uh, what psychiatrists do ordinarily, that is, well, look at cues and build a picture. We, we have to leave it there. Obviously, we wish you good luck. Thank you. That's all for tonight. Jim Lehrer and I will be back on Monday night, and other news permitting, our story will be the troubles over the Panama Canal. I'm Robert McNeil. Good night.
for a transcript, send $1 to the McNeil Lair Report, Box 345, New York, New York, 10019. The McNeil Lair Report was produced by WNET and WETA. They are solely responsible for its content. Funding for this program has been provided by this station and other public television stations and by grants from Exxon Corporation, Allied Chemical Corporation, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Thank you.